Welcome to my talk, Meticulously Modern Mobile Manipulations. And if that's a little bit of a mouthful, you can just at arbitrary times go, hmm. <coughs> All right. Uh, my name is Leon Jacobs. I'm a security researcher at SensePost. And um, a little bit about me, I've been hacking stuff for about 10 years. Been fortunate to spend time at quite a large ISP, at some banks, and currently, you know, as I've mentioned, at SensePost. And um, more specifically, when it happens that I have to do a mobile assessment, I kind of cringe very quickly because um, it's not a fun experience for most people. Now, um, with this talk, I hope to change some of that. And we're going to look at these brand new iPhones and uh, see what uh, we could do to make this hacking scene for us a little bit um, easier and better to work with. Um, but more importantly, actually, we want to cover sort of three disciplines and look, a few, look at a few techniques that could be used for those types of people. One of those would be um, a typical pen tester or a hacker that wants to look at a mobile application and find vulnerabilities or some bug uh, that you could use. The second scenario would be one where you're a malware reverser and maybe you want to understand how this mobile application actually works. Thirdly, you might be responsible for some development with this mobile app that you're interested in. And uh, we'll look at some opportunities where you could use some hacking tools or hacking techniques in your actual development pipeline. But before we can get to the cool stuff, I think first we need to have an honest conversation with ourselves about the state of mobile application hacking. It's not the however old mobile apps have been around, you know, security has significantly improved for both mobile ecosystems and more specifically mobile applications. Uh, and we can't just rampantly walk around and do what we want um, with the apps. Now that could be the fruits of the work that we've been doing. Um, you know, some in this room could be maybe to blame that it's harder today to do, but uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. But if we consider that from a hacking perspective, you know, the harder the ecosystem becomes, the more difficult it is for us to actually understand what our mobile apps might be doing. In fact, it might actually get even more complicated because I think many of us would simply say, well, I don't have a jailbreak for my device or I don't have root access for my device, therefore I cannot perform this assessment or I cannot hack at this application, or at the very least, I can't effectively do that task that I want to do. Now, it is a little bit different today very specifically today, with um, things like Checkrain being around, where uh, a boot chain exploit exists for iOS devices, I think it's up to the iPhone X, uh, where we can get root access to a device, um, you know, and perform these assessments probably how we're used to. If you had a iOS 12.4 device, uh, and you've heard of Uncover before, there was a case where Apple accidentally backported a patch, and um, you could actually have a signed version of iOS jailbroken at that very time. Now, that very specific state is an incredibly rare scenario to be in. You don't often have the opportunity to jailbreak, um, at least with a public jailbreak, um, an assigned iOS version. What's also quite funny about it is around about that time, Apple announced at Black Hat that they will be giving out researcher devices. Little did many of us know they're actually going to give us a jailbreak in a new iOS device. They obviously didn't intend that, but nonetheless. Uh, more importantly, though, as of today, uh, those that might know a utility called Cydia Impactor is actually broken for free development accounts, meaning you can't just sideload arbitrary apps using Cydia Impactor. You sort of have to jump over a bunch of hoops. Now, really what I'm trying to say is a bunch of negative stuff about the state of mobile hacking. We have this incredible reliance on having root, and if we don't have that, we say we won't be able to test uh, these apps. Now, for maybe the more tinfoil hatted in the room, you know, you might know about flashlight apps many years ago that you would download. Don't know why you need a flashlight app, but okay. Um, but it would not just be a flashlight app, right? This, these apps are doing a whole bunch of other things, um, and there was no way really to understand what they were doing. In fact, they might have actually caught us off guard. Um, again, I'd ask why you need a flashlight app. But, um, you know, is our data that's being sent off these devices being monetized in some way? Is it being used against us? You know, are you a high-profile person that has an interest in being secure, um, not knowing that some stuff is leaving your device unintentionally? Now, <clears throat> for, for me and my personal capacity, the boring rhetoric of not having the correct devices to perform an actual mobile pen test is actually something that's been incredibly frustrating for me, um, like, pretty badly. Um, but that was until I came across a 
framework or a utility or, you know, I don't even really know what you should call this, called Frida. Now, most importantly, I can't believe Frida is free to start off with, and the amount of stuff that you can do with it is actually incredible. Today, we're going to be looking at some of the mobile applications, um, or the, its application in the mobile world, but honestly, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that you can do with this that could probably blow your mind. Uh, in a different scenario, I've been hacking some Doom games, and uh, it's quite a lot of fun. But okay, maybe for those that have not seen Frida before, we're at a security con, so we need a, a lame analogy. So I'm going to go with a castle. Um, and in this case, imagine your castle is a mobile application here. Now, the first scenario we have, you have root on your device. Um, and if you look at this castle from that perspective, you can come and go as you wish. You can open any door, you can inspect any room. You know, nothing is really off limits from a mobile app perspective. But when you don't have a jailbreak, um, you probably can't see what's going on in the castle next to you. You're confined in that one that you are, and in this case, an application. And um, it's sort of have to trust what they're up to is what they say they're doing. Now, to, to change that, um, if we add Frida to the mix, you can sort of see this as someone that's been allowed into that castle and has a little torch, um, and he can now look around and see what's going on next to him. Um, he doesn't have a lot of tooling available to him. There's not... Um, you know, a fancy horse that he came riding in, for another bad analogy. But um, it, at this point, there's some capability that exists to see what's going on on the inside, yet still confined to that very specific castle. Now, bad analogies aside, um, we can look at, oh, the very first thing we need to understand is the operating mode Frida would be in. And there's really two operating modes that's important. The first being a server mode, and the second being a gadget mode. Both of these modes expose a JavaScript API that you could use to interact with a mobile application at runtime. And we're going to talk about a lot of runtime stuff now. The server mode is applicable to rooted and jailbroken devices. So everything you're going to see today will work there in server mode. But uh, I'm currently making the claim that that's probably not the most maintainable way to go forward. So we'll focus on the gadget mode um, and how that works. To understand gadget mode, though, um, the only thing that's really a requirement is the target app that you need to work with, you need to be able to modify that application. It's a lot easier in Android world where you can patch a little bit of the um, Smalley code or however the app is built and put together. And at some entry point where logic would execute early, load the gadget mode, which comes in the form of a shared library, uh, and get your free to access into the app. In the iOS world, it's a little bit more complicated. But essentially, you also need to get a decrypted application and patch a gadget in. Um, and that's sort of the requirement to get started with this. Now, um, I refer to a very scientific resource to try and figure out what people are using Frida for. Now, if you've heard of Google Poems before, you can start typing stuff like, I don't know why, my, and then read what the suggestions are. And a similar method are used here to go Frida iOS and maybe see what people are trying to Google for for Frida iOS. Similarly for Android. What you should see, though, is SSL pinning bypasses, jailbreak or root detection bypasses are really very common applications for uh, Frida itself. Now, I believe that that should not be where it stops, um, and I hope to encourage you here uh, that that would be the case. But we could very quickly have a look at what these bypasses really look like. Like, fundamentally, what does it mean when we say we perform an SSL pinning bypass? Now, all of this code here is effectively what one of those bypasses might look like, obviously stripped out a whole bunch of stuff. But what you need to see is there will be a class, for example, called pinning, and there might be a method called check, right? Now, the part that's not commented out with the dot implementation property means with Frida, we get access to that actual method's um, invocation. In fact, when we run a script like this, we can see the entry point and modify the entry of that method. We can change the logic of the method, and more importantly, we can change the return value of that method. That means in this application's normal operating mode, as the app is running, we can modify these parameters, which includes the return value, and make the application perform and behave in a different way. In this case, um, the signature for our method returns a Boolean, so maybe to bypass the pinning check would be simply to return true, meaning the check was successful. Um, it's a rudimentary example. Other ones behave a little bit differently, but that's just sort of give you the idea. Now, I'm in no way discrediting that, and I think it's super useful to be able to do that stuff, but I also think we can do a lot more with um, runtime instrumentation. In fact, if we continue reading some more Frida docs, or you wake up, 
thinking, what else could I do with this stuff? You might learn about some more APIs that are exposed to us. In this case over here, we're looking at just two lines of code that would be applicable to a Java runtime on Android or an Objective-C runtime on iOS. And uh, what we're really doing here is saying, please instantiate, in the case of the first line, a fresh instance of the Java.io class, right? That means not one that already exists in the app, one that we have from the outside instantiated. Now, what's really cool about that is we can now call methods on that class, and we can start manipulating things using that class. Really, what I'm saying is this is external code that got introduced, not as intended by the application, but by me, to be able to do different things to this application. At the bottom, sorry, at the top you initialize one, at the bottom is really just allocation and initialization in Objective-C. So as the analogy goes, I have a hammer and it's time to find that nail that I want to hit with this thing. At this point, while playing with this stuff, I'm not really sure what that meant yet, but uh, I figured that being able to do things different within the context of that app, you know, that could be quite an interesting thing to work with. So f for us, where this actually started going a bit forward, is uh, an assessment comes along. We don't have a jailbroken or a rooted device. Again, a pretty boring scenario to be in, but a very frustrating one. And uh, we've identified we needed access to a very specific database within an app's container. Now remember, two apps don't necessarily freely talk to each other. Um, mobile operating systems go through a lot of effort to segregate those um, apps from each other. So I can't install an app and pull stuff from another container. You know, a different approach is needed. And this is where Frida came along. In fact, I hacked a bunch of shitty scripts together, which actually eventually got a nice Python UI. It took me longer to build the console stuff than actually writing most of these scripts. But um, the bottom line was we had this Frida-powered file manager available to us where we would connect to an application that we've patched, and we can start downloading files out of the container. Now remember, this is not a rooted device or anything. This is just that application got modified, and we're now able to um, you know, execute this code. Cool. Now, I don't trust the demo gods, so I have recorded one. <laughs> um, but I want to show you what some of that stuff might look like. Now, what you'll see over here is a trusty old terminal on the left-hand side with an objection session that's already been started. And in the background here, which I'm probably standing in front of, is uh, the YouTube application on an iPad, and it's just streaming to my laptop during the screen recording. Now, one bit to... Um, Say extra on this, when you on iOS flip between your applications, the moment you sort of background it, a picture would get taken, and that would get used as the state that you would see in the app switcher, right? That picture actually lives inside the container of the application. So we have this Frida-powered um, file manager. We can actually browse using a mostly familiar interface to the directory where these pictures might live, um, and then you know, have a look at those things. In this case over here, we go to the final directory, and if we had to Alice here, we would see some PNG files um, with extension wrapping there that we could download. And we can have a look at what these pictures are that get saved. Um, now again, like I've mentioned, in its infancy, um, Objection was a uh, file manager powered by Frida, so we would just go there and download the file. But we can probably do some other cool things with this as well. In fact, what if we change this and say instead of downloading it via the command line, we start up an HTTP server that lets us browse that directory and see what those files look like. In this case, what you've seen here is an HTTP server getting started. But I think what's not immediately obvious here is that HTTP server starts within the YouTube process on the actual iPad. So if I open my browser and browse to the IP address and that port of the iPad, not my laptop, I can browse the contents of that directory that got served out of the app's container. Right? So now I'm viewing these pictures, those snapshots, um, directly from the iPad, not from my application. The part that should really make your head explode over here is, I can tell you YouTube doesn't have an arbitrary HTTP server embedded as part of its normal production build, but we've gone and introduced this arbitrary logic, which is quite cool, an HTTP server, and extended it for whatever we might want to use it for. All right. Now, please work. Thank you. The, at this point in time, you know, I think it was quite exciting and crazy for us because now we realize we can introduce arbitrary code. So tools that we might be used to in a rooted environment could actually be ported to work within a contained environment, right? Now, um, you know, we started writing some stuff. The community contributed a whole bunch of things. And to take one example would be a keychain dumper. 
in the rooted world, we would um, read a SQLite DB in iOS and uh, simply parse the entries out of that. But in a jailed world, you know, we can't just access that SQLite DB. We need to access it from the context of the, what the app is running as. So just like a developer would write something to dump all the entries for its um, app group in iOS, we could write exactly the same thing, wrap it up in the Frida API, and have a keychain dumper work for that application. Now, if you're looking at an app and that app's context, that's actually quite interesting because you could see what's being done for that app. You don't necessarily care about other applications as they are. Now, hopefully, the most technical slide you would see it took me longer to find the picture than to actually build the rest. But um, the process of building these tools, all of that really means is we hinge off the JavaScript API that we have on the side. And from Frida's perspective, it has this concept of glue, if you can call it that, or bindings into runtimes like Objective-C and a runtime like Java, or even a native runtime. Uh, we can call code, native code in that context, wrapped in JavaScript, and interact with those APIs as normal. Um, and really, I think that's a super powerful technique to have. But okay, let's change um, uh, gears a little bit. And we can talk about application heaps. Now, what I'm saying when we talk about app heaps is you might have an instance of java.io file, and you initialize that class, or you run the constructor, or whatever your runtime is, and an instance of that object lives on the heap somewhere, right? And depending on the runtime and what the rules for garbage collection could be, um, methods would get called on that class, values would get changed as necessary, and in some form that controls some state, right? What we can do is actually enumerate those instances of those classes and work with them as they are right now. So this is a bit different from where we're saying there's app logic, it runs and we change it. No, we're saying there's a live instance of that object and we want to modify properties or call methods on it, not as the actual app's um, flow is calling methods. Now some classes, it might be interesting to sort of get your ideas going. You know, it could be anything from classes that manage cryptography. Why would that be interesting? Well, maybe there's some complicated logic that builds up a key for us and if we can read a value out of that class, we can just copy the key out, right? We don't really care about how we got to that part. Um, maybe there are classes that handle socket connections, some form of configuration. Um, in the Android world, there might be a class loader introducing even more logic into your application. Or really, anything that manages state would be an interesting class for us to poke at and see um, where we're going. Effectively, if we have these live classes, it means if we call a method on them arbitrarily, not via the actual application, or if we change values on those classes, we're ultimately altering the state of what that app looks like and behaves like and assumes is the correct context right now. From a Frida perspective, um, there are two extremely complicated APIs to use called java.choose or objective-c.choose. And the underlying implementations of these are fascinating to read from a source code perspective. But really, calling that line would go and find you those instances of a type of selector or a class name that you want, uh, and you can start doing this type of magic on top of it. But okay, the theory is absolutely mind-numbing sometimes, so let's look at what this might look like uh, in action. I'm going to start with uh, this demo here. Um, and there's this not very popular app called TikTok um, that I have running on the right-hand side, and I have my trusty old terminal on the left-hand side, right? Um, so we'll let that run a little bit, and uh, we're going to start up Objection and um, start playing around with actual instances of classes. Now, what I have to say, I did reverse this app beforehand a little bit to ID which type of classes would be interesting, right? You would probably find you're in this sea of stuff to do, and you need to do some work to find out what would ultimately be interesting. In my case, though, there was a class called AWE Video Player Controller, Objective-C class, and uh, that looked like the type of thing that's actually managing the video that's playing right now. Now what you can do in this case, uh, I'm running the, the command you see there, it's really just sugar over the objective-c.choose method, um, but the output of that should be live instances of AWE player controller that are instantiated, that are being used right now, um, that we can start playing with. The results are three of those, of which we'll get the pointer to where it lives, as well as a little bit of information about how many variables are in that class and how many methods are there. And you can see 141 methods is quite a beefy class um, to work with. Cool. Now, to get an idea of what the state of this class might be, we might actually want to go and say, show me the instance variables on that class, right? 
Now, an instance variable here, you know, its property on a class could give us an idea of what the state is right now. Um, some of those things are really simple values, trues and falses and small bits. Um, but other ones are these handle ones that you would see over here um, that you can in turn also recursively try and enumerate, ultimately doing some information gathering on the class. Now for me, that absolutely sucked. I don't want to do that very uh, often. So there's this extra flag that you could add onto the command called 2UTF8, and that's gonna try and actually print you a string representation of that class. Probably won't give you all the properties, but give you a pretty good idea of what the values of them are. So if we go ahead and run that, now we could see that some of these um, values are actually like URLs. So current item is probably the TikTok uh, URL of where that video lives. Um, and yeah, it gives us a pretty good idea of what's happening. But it doesn't yet tell us this is the actual class that we want to work with. So probably the best way to know if I'm actually working with the right class running that video is to start running some methods on it. Now there are two maybe obvious methods for when it comes to a video player. One being uh, play, I'm jumping this ahead a little bit, and another one being pause, right? And if we did a method list, we can sort of see all of the 141 that we have, which is a bit of a pain to go through, but they are the play and pause methods. So what we can go and do and make sure that we have the right instance is run that method on that specific instance. I'm not saying run play on a instance of AWE video player. No, we specify the pointer of that instance and ask it to pause. And as you can see, that video is actually now paused. So we definitely have the correct instance that we're working with here. As you could imagine, we can run the play method again, and uh, this dude continues jumping off that bridge. All right, now play and pause are simple methods. They don't take any arguments, right? It's uh, just a, sort of a getter setter type thing. Um, but we can also call methods that do take arguments. One could be set content URL string, which if you know some objective C, uh, takes one argument. That um, argument, though, could be arbitrary. It could be many things. In this case, it's a string, which is simple to use. But uh, the reality is, you know, you can't really predict that all of these things might be ahead. So what I went and did is implemented this evaluate command, which would really just give you a small editor where you can run this arbitrary JavaScript over, whoops, um, over an in that specific instance that, because there's a super bright you can see, there's a variable called PTR, and that PTR is actually to that instance of that class inside of this editor. It's a bit to wrap your head around, but don't worry about it. Um, so in my editor, the first thing I did was specify the URL. This is a YouTube URL that I want to call. Um, once I have that URL set, I'm just going to call set contents URL string. It takes one argument denoted by an underscore, so, and then I'm gonna pass in that URL as the new content that I wanted to display. Cool. Now again, if you reverse this a little bit, you would see we need to call another method called prepare to play. And what that would really do is just download the thing in the background and prepare it to play. Right. Um, and in case I forget, I added a note there, so I don't go, I can't remember what that does. Um, and then finally, we, I just print some console output just to make sure that that stuff actually worked because we're hackers, our error handling is great. Um, so print statement is how we debug. Cool. So now we can see the moment we ran that, um, you'd exit the editor with escape and enter. Uh, the screen's gone blank. I paused the video, but you would see the app is definitely still running. Um, the next thing that we probably want to do with this video is to play it, right? So now we can just go back and say um, execute on that instance the play method that we've just changed um, the stream URL for and watch our new <laughs> educational video. <laughs> I'll leave it on a little bit because I know most of you close this immediately. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But I think the key outcome from that is uh, we found a class, we've changed its state without interacting with the application uh, and could you know, make it do cool stuff. Um, that's just a video, but again, there could be crypto classes that are more interesting to you uh, where you can get more interesting values. Now, obviously, iOS is not the only platform that we can do this on. Um, this is possible in Java-based apps as well. And one class that might be interesting to look at would be a next class loader or path class loader or whatever class loader is available for your application. Now I did a similar thing as I just did with TikTok to the YouTube app for uh, Android. And I said, show me the instances of the next class loader that are live right now. What's quite cool about uh, Java is many classes have this two string method. 
I think is amazing because I can just read that and don't code a lot of stuff to see things. But one of the classes that YouTube app is loading is called the APK. You have to believe me that I did not name it that. They literally call it the APK. Now, as you can imagine, the APK seems like, what? Cool. Thankfully, we've already built our super complicated file manager. So because we could get the path for where that lives, we can download it and you can analyze it locally. Um, but it sort of should give you the idea that at runtime, things are interesting and you can change stuff, get information. Um, if you had to statically analyze, uh, analyze the YouTube app, it's not immediately obvious that the APK is not actually the one you're working with now. It's something that they're doing some weird stuff with. But it sort of leads us to this thing about, we can actually use this stuff for like malware analysis, right? What if we don't really know what this app is doing? The reality is, once an app is already running and things have been going along, that'll be the final state that app is in. But when you look at this from a static analysis perspective, chances are good there's a whole bunch of obfuscation that's being applied or there's you know, a bunch of things that will ultimately try and hide what the true intent of that application is. I searched for that photo for a very long time. Um, you don't really know what they really uh, are up to and you want to try and figure out what that might be. Now I've mentioned you know, they could use some form of packer or obfuscate it in some way um, and make it difficult for you at a static analysis perspective to know what's really going on. But Java has this really cool thing called reflection. Again, a moment for that amazing picture, where um, they could do some creative ways in which they could dynamically invoke methods, again, making it difficult for a static analysis process. Not impossible, but making it difficult. But at runtime, um, getting the app logic to run that they intended. What's really cool about this, though, is if they actually are using reflection, using an invoke method, we can hook that invoke method and see exactly what it is that's going on. Um, and again, as an example, uh, runtime analysis actually allowing this stuff to be a lot easier. Malware guy thinks he's hiding, but we'll hook the same method they're using. Okay, but let's change over a little bit. So what about like existing tools? Up until now, we're saying, you know, we can hook stuff and we can see um, what's happening right now. We've got control over the logic of some functions, which we can change, for example, to bypass pinning. Or we can start building our own tooling embed HTTP servers into apps, maybe build keychain dumpers, all of these things. But I think we're making ourselves look silly sometimes if we don't look at the existing tools that are already there, especially the type of tools that developers might want to use. Um, for them, while they're writing apps, you know, they also need to debug, not us as hackers. So that stuff might already be super useful for us. Now, some tools might come in the format of uh, shared libraries, and Frida allows this complicated API called module.load, and uh, what that actually does is do the hard work for you, depending on what OS you're on, what architecture you're in, perform the correct um, calls to actually load the shared library. You know, it'll be different on Mac OS and Linux. But uh, in the end, you'll have the shared library loaded, and you can start calling the methods exposed by it. Similarly, in the Java world, you maybe have an arbitrary jar. You can also use a path class loader, and finally actually load that class and call methods on top of it. Now, Two examples of tools that already exist. That's pretty cool. One of them is Flex by the folks at Flipboard for iOS, and another one called Stetho from Facebook. It is being superseded by a project called Flipper now, um, which is like cool plus plus for Stetho. But uh, in this case here, I'll just show you those two. And there's another extra one that we'll go with afterwards. So let's look at a demo of what that might look like. Um, please work. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, the first example would be the iOS Flex app. Um, again, trusty old terminal, YouTube app on my iPad, um, and we'll start an objection session, but this time specifying a slash p flag to a uh, plugins folder. This plugins folder is nothing really other than just some convenience methods to run a Frida script um, that contains a plugin. It exposes some extra commands now called plugin, flex, and then load to actually go and load that plugin. And what this would actually do is Check, is the dialog that contains the plugin, in this case libflex, available on the iPad's file system? If it's not, upload that. And then once it's finished, actually initialize it. Now what you should see is this little bar open up at the top uh, that I've just moved down a little bit. And that's flex itself that just got sideloaded with Frida being running in the app already. With the toolkit Raptor, you get the idea. Like there's a whole bunch of level <laughs> of stuff that made this finally happen, but yeah. Okay, now you can start using Flex itself, browse classes, browse the file system, which is something that you might want to do. And um, you should also check out its network activity monitor. It's pretty amazing. 
but yeah, you know, just like a developer would go and use these tools, we can do it exactly the same way. Now, at this point, you might go, okay, that's cool. You've added all this complexity when I could have loaded Flex exactly the same way you loaded Frida, to which I would admittedly agree. However, if you had to accidentally close Flex, then you'd probably need to restart the app and uh, get that whole thing to go. In this case, with our plugin, we can just load it again, and uh, Flex is available to reuse um, as it is. Trust me, the YouTube app does not come embedded with Flex. This is something that we've added arbitrarily. Cool. So what about an Android case? Now here, we um, again have an Android app just streaming to my computer, trusty old terminal, and at the bottom, we have Chrome open, but this time with the inspector, and you can see I have a super expensive Samsung device connected to it that um, I want to debug with. Now, um, what I'm going to do is simply just start Reddit up uh, and use it as normal. So I'll pop that open there, connect the objection session to it, again specifying the plugins that I want to load. Uh, we should see here that the Steto plugin specifically was being used. Now what I will do is browse to my favorite subreddit for educational purposes um, and try and learn something about what, how to program better. And finally, when I'm bored of that, I might go say, cool, let's look at what this application looks like underneath. You know, and, and really, it's a hard question to answer, what do I want to look at? But you, know, you can sort of browse around and poke at things. Now, from a runtime perspective, you know, static analysis tools can give you this, but we can say, hey, which activities exist within this Android app? An activity is something, we're interested in that because we can arbitrarily start them. If you had to go through this list, you know, one that might catch your eye is called data logging activity. And I would immediately ask, like, what does data logging activity mean? Okay, cool. Well, let's start that activity uh, again at runtime. Yes, you can do this stuff with ADB and a whole bunch of other tools exist for it, but it's convenient to do it from here where we could now, once it's launched, look at the Android app to see what that actually is. I don't really want to say a whole bunch of stuff in fear of getting in trouble here, but um, I have questions about a lot of the fields that are <laughs> inside of this data logging activity. I also don't know how to get to this activity legitimately, like if there's a five button somewhere that you do to see what uh, that looks like. But okay, now given my curiosity about what this data is, I figured maybe I want to interact with the data a different way. Now remember the Steto plugin that I mentioned in the beginning? Well, we can go ahead and actually load that because Steto provides us the ability to interact with that data through Chrome. So what you see here is the jar file gets uploaded, it tries to search for it in a class loader, and finally when it finds it, calls its initialization methods. But now what you should see is the Reddit app has popped up in the inspector, and I can hit the inspect button, which pops open a new window for us to interact with the actual data in that container. Now again, this is not a tool I wrote, like this is a thing that developers can use today to help them debug stuff. And we're simply just uh, using exactly the same stuff to see at what data is interesting for us. Now at the moment you're seeing the, if that's not playing, um, all the data that's statically there, or we can look at the databases that exist. One database of interest could be this Pure DB that has a logs table, and this information looks very similar to that stuff we just saw in that data logging activity. What's really cool about um, Stetho is we can actually run raw SQL queries on those uh, databases and get sort of live output of what's in that table right now. More importantly though, what I hope your mind goes to is what if you're playing a game and they say you have 100 coins currently and you connect that game to this and you now have 1,000 coins or more, right? You can change state even from this perspective, not just fancy heap interactions, but maybe updating a value in a column. Now, dev tools are cool and all, but what about hacker tools? Has anyone used Metasploit before? <laughs> Probably a silly question, yeah. Now, um, in this case over here, a terminal that's divided into two. At the bottom, I'm going to start up Metasploit. Really no fancy syntax, exactly what you would expect. And at the top, I would start um, objection. This is connected, or this session is actually on my phone. Like, not right now, but I recorded this demo. Running the latest iOS with the app that I've written but it's not a jailbroken phone. Um, as you can see there, 13.2.3 being the latest version um, and the metal plugging available. Um, I first go and configure Metasploit to accept a connection uh, for a interpreter. Uh, I specify the 64-bit interpreter reverse TCP. It's a stage payload already. Um, set the allos, run, cool. And then from an objection perspective with that ready, I first go and load metal. Now remember the logic here is if the metal dialog doesn't exist, I realized I should explain Metal before we carry on with this. Has anyone heard of Metal before? 
No? Okay. So METAL is a project by Rapid7 that's intended to be a low resource interpreter written in native C, right? So not a thing that gets staged remotely via Metasploit, something that you could deploy on an IoT device, for example, and connect back to Metasploit. Um, what's really cool is it has a, um, the project you can download, and you literally go make target what your target is architecture-wise, and it would compile all of these shared libraries or dialogs for any architecture that you really want. Once that shared library we have uh, available to us, all of the logic that we've been using to load developer tools can be used to load a Metasploit session, right? So in this case here, I've gone and loaded uh, Metal. And finally, um, you know, I would encourage you, there's a bit of a blog post about how I actually managed to get that to run. But the point is we end up getting this command where we can now connect that Metal session back to an iPhone, which uh, is listening over there. So I'll hit enter. I get a shell. It's not calc, so you probably don't believe me, but it's a, uh, it's a real shell that came from it. So from here onwards, you know, you could run something like sysinfo, and you can see I have a interpreter shell running on uh, my iPhone. Now, I don't have root here, so you're not going to just do what you want. If you were to explore the post exploitation modules available for iPhones in Metasploit, you're going to see there's some old stuff to read images and read text. The reality is none of that stuff is going to work in this case, right? I'm running this in an app. I'm constrained to that application's context. Of course, at this stage, if there's a sandbox escape, you know, that could be available to you. If, uh, you know, if you read some of the Google Project Zero stuff that's come out, you know, maybe there are some attack avenues available to you. But um, from a perturbative perspective, you know, we have a shell, and we can use that in that context of that app. We could also, just like with objection, manage or list the file, file system, uh, interact with it. In this case, I actually need to change to a directory within the sandbox for this app. So I would do that here. Um, and you should see that the dialog exists on that file system via interpreter. Um, one, one attack that does work quite nicely with this setup is you can actually configure port forwards. So if you do manage in some way to compromise the device and get this running, imagine a case where the device is maybe connected to a VPN. You can connect back to it and maybe have access to that corporate network. So you know, let your imagination go wild. I didn't tell you to do that. Uh, you should follow Harold's advice and not go to jail. But OK, cool. Um, the last sort of major topic I quickly want to go through, I might run out of time a bit, is to speak about integration um, options. So, so far, you know, we can build tools, we can integrate, um, sorry, we can build tools, we can instrument at runtime, but what about actually making this part of a development pipeline? The more important part of why I was thinking about this is the apps that we would get to test at the end is that final build artifact that would end up on a target device, right? Irrespective of what the process is at the end, that thing that you have running there is the true form of what that application is. If you have some debug flags and stuff, that's probably not included, and it might make it difficult to test for that stuff. But if we can test at runtime, the final artifact that gets deployed, um, you know, that might be a good place to be at. Now, the building blocks for this mostly existed already as well. We have a mobile device. It's got Frida running on it via an application. And uh, there's this objection tooling that's already a Python environment. And, um, it took quite a long time to get an API going because it was just three lines of code to get that to work. And when I speak of an API, it's really just a JSON serialized interface that you can call with an HTTP client to run arbitrary Frida scripts. In fact, uh, as part of objection, there are already a whole bunch of methods that you could call natively, for example, iOS binary info, but you could also send this arbitrary Frida scripts to also evaluate. So if you have a special case or something you need to do, run that script and get the output and make a decision from a testing perspective um, if it passes or it does not. So if we look at one more demo quickly. Oh, I might have messed that up. Let me go. I need a new laptop. Uh, many folks probably have heard of Jenkins before. In this case, I have a uh, instance of Jenkins running that has a build an instrument project. Um, and if we very quickly look at the configuration for this, we'll see that all my project is really doing is um, building my application with, uh, when I get there, building the app. Once that's done, um, connect to a Mac that's running in a VM and run all the simulator commands to install the build app. Once uh, the simulator's up and running, I would start objection exposing the API, right? 
uh, once I have the API ready, I can finally do some testing. And in my case, I want to make sure that a whole bunch of binary protections are actually enabled right at the end. Now, yes, I know you could check this in the project's configuration, but this way we can confirm that that's truly the case once this app is finally running. At the end, that was just a bunch of cleanup stuff because my hard drive only has 20 megs of hard drive space. At least that's what it feels like sometimes. And uh, we can go ahead and build that project. So I did speed this up a little bit, but you should see that entire process completing. Uh, and I want to emphasize the fact that this test, although in a simulator, is really the final build artifact that you have. You know, if you have SSL pinning, for example, enabled, in some way you could probably instrument that and make sure, is it really working when we strip this off to a customer? Um, in this case here, we'd see those uh, call requests would finally go through once the API is up. In my case, I care about two or three of these things that I wanted to test. And when that's done, the build should be considered successful. And you know, whatever the next step in your pipeline is, you can continue. Cool. So, to summarize, I hope I remember this. Um, I think uh, runtime analysis can be way more than just hooking things. We don't have to just use it to bypass SSL pinning or to bypass some root checks. Um, we can build new capabilities, both in the form of tooling, but also some arbitrary integrations that you might find uh, useful. Um, I want to emphasize that we don't need root to do this stuff. If someone tells you that I don't have root, I can't do anything for you, that's absolutely a lie. We can do stuff. Um, it might be limited in things that are confined to that um, sandbox for the app, but uh, you know we can continue on this avenue. And more importantly, I think it's a more sustainable avenue going forward, not depending on what today's state of jailbreaking might be. Do we have one? Do we have one? Don't we have one? There, my English is now finished. Cool. And finally, everyone can use this. If you're interested, source code is available on GitHub. Let's chat about it. I'm excited about this stuff. Thank you. Take questions, and I'm just repeating the question. Sure. Before. Sure, sure. I want to take a sip of water. Any questions? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? Do I have a? Right, so the question is, can you use this to bypass the certificate pinning for the more recent versions of Android? Um, very good question because of the network security config stuff. Uh, yes, you can. I think you need to remember that whatever the code flow is for that application to make decisions, at runtime, you can manipulate that. Now, for me, what I've noticed most commonly, a pinning check would be either a true and false being returned from a method, which if you can in hook on that, you can return that true and a false. Another implementation sometimes goes, if the pinning checks fails, it actually throws an exception. And in that case, you simply don't run the logic that would throw that exception. You just return the method and the pinning check would bypass. Now, that being said, some of these implementations are in native code, so it's not as simple as just doing a true and false. You know, you have to do a little bit of work to get to that point. But uh, we can relatively generically bypass that stuff, but many of them does require some extra work uh, to get past it. Cool, anything else? My favorite color is also blue. <laughs> okay.